that diagram. Every next time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for coming by. Amen. For the Wednesday edition of the Transforming Lives broadcast here on Facebook Live. Amen. We're doing this study in the, the kingdom of God and the gospels. It's a systematic study as we go step by step through the gospels. And we're still in Matthew. And we're still in Matthew chapter 13. Amen. Forgive me for not being on on yesterday. Um, amen. But we're going to get this thing in order. God is a healer. And he continues to heal. And to deliver and make whole and set free. Amen. For that is the power. Amen. That he has on the inside. That's the power that he's given to us. He said to us in his word that healing is the truth. He told the woman, the Canaanite woman, that healing is the children's bread. And she says she might not be a child, but even the dogs, even those, amen, who might not be in, but they... They can still eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. He said, baby, baby, girl, you got it. Go on home. Your daughter is delivered of the devil. Set free because she wasn't concerned about the religiosity of, you know, being a Jew of that, being of that culture, of being of that certain status. You know, she knew that Jesus was the Messiah. How do we know? If we go back to it, it's... <laughs> If we go to that particular story, I believe is in Matthew 15. But if we go to that particular story, she came to him and said, Son of David, have mercy on me. In other words, she recognized that he was the Messiah. And because she recognized he was the Messiah, she also knew the power that the Messiah had. And that the Messiah had the power to deliver her daughter from the devil. So she came to agreement. God said, Jesus said, it is not expedient, it is not meat to give the children's bread to the dogs. She said, truth, Lord. <laughs> but even the dogs eat of the bread that falls from the master's table. So I said, all that to say, <laughs> <clears throat> we thank God for healing. We thank him for his deliverance, his keeping power. And we thank you once again for tuning in. And we're going to continue our study. We're going to go into... Matthew chapter 13 today and again and we're going to pick up around uh, verse 34 that, that's where we're going to go I would go get into a review of the previous broadcast but you're just going to have to go back and look at the previous videos because if I go back it's going to get us off into a tangent <laughs> I'm trying to <coughs> pardon me trying to stay on task amen Glory to God. Hallelujah. So let's pray. Amen. Let's get started. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, bless your holy and righteous name, Father. We bless you and we praise you. We honor you for you are God. You are our Father. But we just praise you today, Lord God. We just love you, Lord God. We love you for who you are. We love you, Lord God, before, because you first loved us, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name, Father. Lord God, we thank you for your word, the power of your word, the anointing that's on your word, the ability of your word to destroy yokes and to remove heavy burdens. The anointing that's on your word, Lord God, <clears throat> to heal, to set free, to make whole the anointing that's on your word, Lord God, to reveal to us truths 
and show us things to come. Father, we thank you for your word. They, we did not come to the line to hear man's opinion, man's traditions, or man's ideas. But we come to hear your word. We come to hear the truth of your word, Lord God. Oh God, feed us this bread from heaven. Feed us till we want no more. Feed us to the overflow, Lord God. Feed us to the full, Lord God. Not that we will just get spiritually obese, Lord, but that we get full of your word because in your word, your word is spirit and it's life. So as we partake of your word, Lord God, it's filling us with your spirit, Lord God, and it's giving us life. And that life is producing after its kind, Lord God. And that life that's producing after its kind, Lord God, we want to give to others, Lord God. That they might be brought in, Father. Feed us this bread. Give us this water, Lord God. That we never hunger. And that we would never thirst, Lord God. And that we have such an overflow that we give it to others, Lord God. That they might be filled. That their thirst might be quenched, Lord God. Holy Spirit, have your mighty way even right now. Hallelujah. Thank you for the power of your word, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, and I thank you for those who are on the line, who are listening live, or who even be listening to the recording, Lord God, that your anointing can be show up in the in the live, and it can go through distances, Lord God. It can go through the airwaves, Lord God. Your healing power, your anointing, Lord God, can reach, Lord God, distant places, even from here. Even as I speak through this Facebook Live through the cell phone, Lord God, your anointing is going forth, Lord God, and it's healing, and it's delivering, and it's setting free, Lord God, by your power, Lord God. It's empowering your people, Lord God, to become all that you created them to be, Lord. So we thank you once again, Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts. Give us the word that will bring new life, Lord God. That we will be all that you created us to be. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And amen. Once again, welcome. Once again to the Transforming Lives broadcast. Amen. I'm your host, Brother Anthony Young. Amen. And the purpose of this broadcast, we call it Transforming Lives. But not just transforming life by giving you information. Yes, there's some information I'm giving you, but we want this information to take a life. We want it to take shape. As I stated earlier, his word is spirit and it's life. <coughs> Pardon me. It is spirit and it is life. In other words, this word, this this what's causing the transformation is us taking this word into our spirit, taking this word into our hearts, and then allowing it to take up residence in us and how does the Lord know that it's taking up residence in us how do others know that it's taking up residence in us that we're living the life that we're being the expression <clears throat> we want to be the expression of what we're learning we want to be the expression of this word uh, uh, we want to be the expression of the likeness and image of God when he sent Jesus into the earth, he, God restored us back to his image and his likeness. And we are now, because of the, by way of the Holy Spirit, we are now the expression of the image and likeness of God. We are now the expression of God's moral integrity, his moral character and integrity. Amen. We are now the expression of Glory to God of, amen. We are now the expression of his moral character and integrity. We are now walking in the image and likeness of God. As Jesus is, so are we now in this present world. So this broadcast is coming, it's called Transforming Lives because we understand that <clears throat> through the word of God, pardon me, through this word of God that we learn our identity, we learn our purpose, we learn who we are, because that's really the, the trouble in the world today. The trouble with the world is men don't know their identity. They don't know who they are. They allow their culture, they allow their communities, 
families and other things to speak things on them and put things on them and tell them, or even media, to tell them who they are. When it's not so, in order to understand, oh God, the purpose of a thing, you have to go to the maker. You have to go to the maker. So in order for mankind to understand who they are, they must go back to the maker. And so this word, this word that comes from the maker, getting into our spirits, feeding on this word, understanding God's purpose, understanding God's mission. And that's why we're in this, this systematic study of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> because this message is the one that restores us back to our identity. Yes, Lord God, he saved us. By the power of his blood, his death, his burial, his resurrection. Oh God, it raised us from the dead. It set us free. It gave us back and it restored back the fellowship. It restored back the un that broken fellowship that Adam did when he, when he disobeyed God. When he committed, committed high treason against the king of kings, the Lord of lords. But God has restored that dominion back to us. He has restored that unbroken fellowship to us. But unless we understand God's original intent, and now that we're coming into the understanding of his original intent, his original intent was for us to have dominion. Not over one another, but to have dominion over our sphere of influence, dominion over our circumstances and situations. He wants us to have dominion over our thoughts. What we take in, what we take in, what we release. It all comes through this transforming power of this message of the kingdom. So let, let's get into it. But that's what the Transforming Lives broadcast is about. It's a radio ministry, the broadcast ministry of Kingdom Vision Ministries International. Our local ministry is here in Philadelphia. Amen. But we broadcast and our reaches all over the world, all over. The, the nations are being reached right now through this vehicle, through this ministry. So and we, we don't say that to brag, but Jesus said it like this over in Matthew chapter 24. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the world as a witness. Then the end would come. All the things that are going on in our world today, the wars, the rumors of wars, political upheaval, all the things that people are up in arms about. <coughs> Jesus said, don't let it trouble you. Don't be afraid. Guess what he said? But the end is not yet. The end is not yet. These are only the birth pains. These are the only things that are going on in this earth today are only showing us how close we are. And really what it's telling us, it's a signal to the church. It's an alarm to the church for the church to understand where we are <clears throat> in this time frame, where we are in this Kairos moment, where we are in this moment of time, where we are right here presently, and what, amen, the assignment should be. The assignment is getting people, restoring people back to the dominion laws, restoring people back to the likeness and image of God through repentance of sin, through being born again, through the Holy Spirit, by way of Jesus Christ, by way of the Holy Spirit, amen, that restoration. So that's the goal. That's the aim of this broadcast. So let's go into the Word. And let's open our Bibles up to Matthew chapter 13. As I stated, I'm not going to go into review because that's going to take me to another direction. But we're going to open it to Matthew 13, and we're going to begin at verse 34. God bless all of you who have tuned in. God bless you, all of you, the people of God. Amen. Ambassadors, royal priesthood. A holy nation. Amen. Glory to God. Matthew chapter 13. And beginning at verse 34. 
And it reads, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables. And without a parable spake he not unto them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then Jesus sent the multitude away, <coughs> pardon me, and went into the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. The other day on Monday, that's where we left off. Amen. We start out with the parable of the tares of the field. Then we start, we went into the parable of the leaven and the parable of the mustard seed. Now we're going back in and Jesus, his disciples, his rulers in training, those who God was preparing to carry his ministry after he left out of here. He was not just making them disciplined rulers, disciplined followers, but he was making them and causing them to become rulers in training. <clears throat> they were one, going to be the ones after he left to walk in this dominion, walk in that power that was upon Jesus. He commissioned them and deputized them and commanded them to go forth. <clears throat> we read those things in past verses and past teachings. I may have to go back and make some of those earlier teachings available. But let us keep it moving. But here, he answered in verse 37. He answered and said to them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. You know, I have to go back before I go back to verse 37. Let's go back to verse 18 because I want to read the entire parable. and Then I'll come back to verse 37. Okay? All right, verse 18, it says, uh, if I go to verse 17, that's going to start something. Amen. It's going to say, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm going wrong, wrong verse, wrong verse. I'm sorry. Let's go back to verse 24. That's the parable. I'm going to go back to the parable of the sower. Let's go to verse 24. That's the parable <laughs> of the tares of the field. Amen? Amen. Verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then have it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy have done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also, up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest and in the time of in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, <coughs> gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Amen. Now let's go back to verse 37. And he answered and said to them, Here he that soweth that good seed that we just talked about is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend <coughs> pardon me, and them which do iniquity and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. The parable of the tares of the field. Now I want to go back, back to verse 37. It tells us once again that the sower 
He that soweth the seed, soweth the good seed, is the son of man. Now this good seed is what? What did Jesus say? The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. So, so that seed is representing the kingdom, the message of the kingdom, the life of the kingdom, which Jesus came carrying upon his shoulders, which he came, as we've already read in, in, in previous verses, especially back in Matthew 10 and 7, he sent them out. He sent out the 12, he commissioned the 12, and then he sent them out saying, as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's Matthew 10, <clears throat> verse 7. So he sent them out, right? And he that soweth this good seed of the kingdom of God is the son of man, representing Jesus, right? Then verse 38 says, the field is, the, this verse 38, let, let's listen to this for a moment. It says, the field is the world, the good seed are the, oh, I, I just saw something myself that I have to correct immediately. Listen to his verse 38. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of, the, oh my God. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. Now, the field is the world. Now, how many times in our religious traditions and religious settings when we read this verse we thought that Jesus was talking about the church we heard the term wheat and tear we always signify that with the church and the church there's wheat and there's tares and let them grow up together but as we see the master Jesus himself see we read this but we brushed over it. And the reason why we brushed over it is because we didn't understand kingdom. I'm receiving revelation even as I'm reading this right now, Sister Odelia. I, I, I'm reading this and, and things are just leaping at me that I didn't notice before. Because of, you know, I'm still being delivered from religion. <laughs> Truth be told, God is still delivering me and still purging me of some old religious mindsets and old religious thinking. But let's get back to you said the field is the world. Look at that. The field the field is not the church. The field is the entire world. Listen to this. He the, and then look at this part. I just told you that the the good seed was the word of the kingdom, right? But listen to this. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. Wow, and that just, I'm, I'm tripping because I just caught that, oh dear, I just caught that, Maria, that the, the good seed, listen, are the children of the kingdom. Jesus being the sower, and he goes out and he's sowing the good seed, but the good seed is not the kingdom. So, but it's the children of the kingdom that he is dispatching into all the world with the kingdom message. Did you catch that? I just did. <clears throat> the field is the world. The field is the world. Not the church, but the entire world. And the good seed that Jesus is, who is the sower, <clears throat> is spreading are the children of the wicked one. But the tares, the wheat, I mean, the weeds, the Darnell weeds, are the children of the wicked one. So God created this world. God created this world. This, 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 this world, and another word for this world, is the cosmos, which he had a divine order. He had a divine order that he created everything in. And he added, but Adam and Eve. Uh, they they abdicated the throne. They gave up dominion. They sinned against God, giving rulership, ownership over to the devil. But God's plan, as we stated earlier, using Jesus to come back into the earth to restore mankind back to that first dominion, restoring mankind back to the dominion that man had at the first, 
but it can only be received through repentance. The only way that you can receive the kingdom now is to repent of your sins. That means not only to change your direction, but also means to change your thinking, not just what you think, but how you think. Turn, change direction, turn away from your previous life of sin, turn towards God and receive now once again the high thoughts of God. That's what that repent, re, re means to repeat, to have over again. Pent is a prefix, but it's a word that means like the word penthouse, where it's the high thoughts. In other words, repent means to receive and take on once again the high thoughts of God. Adam and Eve in the, the garden in the beginning, they thought from the high thoughts of God. And so what the Lord has done through Jesus Christ, restoring us back to himself by way of the Holy Spirit, now wants to restore back to us the high thoughts of God. So that as we are the high thoughts of God and we receive this kingdom, receiving this dominion, receiving back who we once were, being restored back to the dominion that was lost. Amen. Being restored back. I, I got to read verse 38 again. See, that just jumped off the page of me. The field is the world, not the church. I know for years we were taught that. For years we thought that's what it was. For years we thought that in the church was the, the, the tares and the wheat. No, it's the entire world, all the creation, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. <clears throat> but the tares are the children of the wicked one. That word wicked is the Greek word paneros, meaning the devil himself, the wicked one, the twisted one, the devil himself. The tares are the children of the king, and the enemy that sowed them is the devil. I just read that. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. See, we always thought about that. I'm just thinking about that. All those years thinking that that parable was talking about the church, and it's talking about the entire world. It's talking about all of God's creation. Because guess what? Before the enemy came in, even though the enemy has temporary possession of it now, but God is still in charge. <laughs> the devil is still his pawn. Still, it's due, boy. Regards, you know, he's letting them have a little, you know, leeway right now, but he is doomed to the pit. He is doomed to the lake of fire. But listen to it. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. Wheat and tear. Now, I was just looking at it, and I had something up here that I wanted to show you. Maybe I'll get an opportunity to show you <coughs> at another time. Amen. Maybe I'll get a chance to show you at another time. But that difference between, see, let's keep on, let me keep on moving. Let me keep on moving. Let me keep on moving. I got to go back. I got to go back. Let's go back to verse 30 for a moment, because I think even a couple of days ago, I said as we're reading this out, that we want to take a special look at uh, Matthew 13 and 30, because it says, let both grow together until the harvest. Well, did we just read that the harvest is the end of the world, right? Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares, and buy them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And why does God want to wait till the harvest? And he was given that picture, that illustration, in an Afri agricultural setting of those who understood agriculture, understood <coughs> how wheat and and those Darnell weeds grew together because the really you could not tell the difference between the wheat and the darnel. I had a picture up here, but I lost my illustration. <laughs> but wheat and tear look just alike. 
They look just, they look, as they're growing, when they're sprouting, as they're coming into bloom, they look just alike. You can't tell which one is which. Uh-uh. But let them keep growing. Let them keep becoming mature. But when they come to the fullness of maturity, when they come to full growth, darn <coughs> wheat, because of the, the 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 wheat that's on the end of it, the kernels on the end of it causes the wheat to bow over, causes the wheat to bow, causes the wheat to bend because of the weight of the 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 fullness of the wheat growing at the end of the wheat, so it causes it to bend. But darn now, those weeds they don't bend; they stand straight up. It's a good, it's such a great illustration because those the wheat are bowed to the Lord, right? They they submitted to God, but Darnell is stubborn, stiff necked. Huh. No matter what you do, I'm gonna stand straight up. If you tell me to, I ain't bowing down. So Jesus said, at the end of this thing, we're gonna be able to separate the wheat from the tear. Right now, let them grow together. There's some in our lives, there are even some believers who look like they, you know, they weep. They look like they, you know, they belong. And I'm not just talking about in the physical building, but I'm just talking about in the world itself, just being around people. You can't tell. And really what a shame is at this day and time, you really can't tell. Unless you observe someone's life, unless you see the life. But Jesus is at the end of this thing. When I wrap this thing up, the angels are going to come forth and they're going to gather. Let's, let's keep reading. Let's keep reading. That's, that's a good place to stop. Verse 40. <coughs> Matthew 13 and 40. And it reads, As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom. Listen, did you listen to that? They shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. Out of the Son of Man shall send forth his angels and shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity. So he's going to go into this world. He's going to gather and he's going to separate the just from the, from the wicked in, in the world. Yeah, it might be some in the church too. Yeah, I no doubt. But he's going to go into the world. He's going to separate the wicked from the just. Oh God, this is the picture. And he's going to bind them into bundles. And shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Verse 42. There shall be weeping, wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear let him hear. So therefore, let's keep on going. Verse 44, some of my most wonderful, my favorite verses here in Matthew 13. Verse 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, <clears throat> the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth, and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Listen to that. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, whom when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Did you hear that? Verse 44 again, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hidden in a field. Treasure is expensive. Treasure, and look at it, he said it was treasure hidden in a field. <clears throat> and when he found that treasure, he hid it. He found a little treasure, and he hid it, and then he went back home and sold everything that he had to buy that field. Because he knew that if I found this little piece of treasure in this one place, it's got to be more treasure. It's got to be more treasure. It's got to be more treasure all over. This just can't be the only place where there's some treasure. So I'm going to sell all that I have. 
<clears throat> it's the pearl of great price. Look, the man found this one pearl of great price and sold all that he had and brought that pearl of great price. <clears throat> That's why we are so, those of us who preach this message, those of us who are proclaiming this message of the kingdom, the reason why we want to give to you the urgency of the hour and the importance of it, because this is the treasure that was hidden in the it was the treasure that was hidden in the fields of religion. This was the message that was hidden in plain view. It was right there in front of us, and we couldn't see it. That's why we're doing this study. That's why I'm on a mission to go through these verses, to go through these chapters, to go through these gospels, to point out to you the urgency and the priority of us preaching the message of the kingdom of God. It's the urgency. This is the message that God commissioned his son to come into the world preaching. That's what he did when he said John the Baptist. John the Baptist's first message was repent for the kingdom of heaven was as it had. That was in Matthew 3 and 2. Jesus came out of the wilderness of temptation in Matthew 4, 17. First message he preached publicly was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he grabbed the 12 and sent them out and told them, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the pearl of great price. But <clears throat> the only way to get it is to do what we're doing now. Seeking, studying. Look, look, keep your hand there in Matthew 13 and go with me to Proverbs. Amen. Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25. <coughs> And we'll start at verse 1. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2. And it reads, These are also proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied out. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, <coughs> but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Did you catch that? It is the, verse 2, you might want to highlight this now. Highlight that verse. It's in, it's in the Old Testament, but that's still a kingdom verse. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search a matter out. What do you mean it's the glory of God to conceal? Did he want to conceal this from us? Did he want to hide this from us? He hid it so it could be found. We just had, we just, last month was April. You know, many people celebrated Easter. And one of the things that they do during Easter, I'm not, you know, propping this up or, you know, promoting it in any way, but it's a good example. In some places, including churches, <laughs> had Easter egg hunts. And these Easter egg hunts, they go home and they prepare these eggs and they go out in a little field or wherever and they hide these eggs. But are they hiding the eggs to keep the children from fighting? No. They're not trying to hide these eggs from the children. They're hiding them that they might be found. They are The people, they hide these eggs that they might be found. And so through Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything that you need will be added unto you. So, seek ye first, a seeking. <coughs> Matthew, Proverbs 25 and 2. <coughs> it's, all right. it's the honor, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the honor of kings is to search a matter out. In other words, God wants to know. Oh, he said over in Matthew chapter 5, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, the same shall be filled. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness. We have to have a hunger and a thirst to know the mind of God. We have to have a hunger and a thirst to seek the truths of God. We've been so caught and so brought up on a diet of traditions of men. 
we've been brought up so long on a diet of uh, denominational doctrines that for so long we believe the word and we read the word after the minds of our denomination or even sometimes non-denomination which is really a denomination but they just don't they think because they don't have a title of their name but there's certain things that they believe outside of you know the will of God but in this kingdom uh, are you getting a sense so far from what we read so far in these 13 chapters that we've gone over so far those of us who've been here the entire time are you starting to sense are you starting to get it that, that this is what God wants us, this is the foundation that the Lord wants us to stand on? Because, if, look, when we understand the kingdom, we understand our identity. One of the verses, I, I quoted it earlier, but it's over in what, 2 Peter chapter 1, that you, or chapter 2, that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. And the word peculiar doesn't mean strange. Peculiar means valuable. It means rare. It means set apart. You are a royal priesthood, a peculiar people, a holy nation that have been called out of darkness and set forth to sing the praises of him who have called you out of that darkness. We've been given a kingdom. That's the idea. That's the message. That's the the thing that God wants. And I, I just want to know, are you starting to understand that through what we're reading thus far? Are you starting to understand and pick up the importance of this thing? This is not a fad. This is not some buzzword that, we, that you hear people use, even though for some it is a fad, and for some it is a buzzword that they only use to their advantage, you know, when they want to. But really, that's what this entire Bible is about. It's about a king, his kingdom, his royal family. We are supposed, this book is about us, and the words, as I stated earlier in this book, it's supposed to cause us. Anyway, oh, pardon me for just a moment, I'm sorry. Amen. But he said, it is the glory of God, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2, to conceal a thing, to hide a thing, to conceal a matter. But it is the honor of kings to search a matter out. We have to make this kingdom righteousness our number one priority. Jesus said it. That's what Jesus said. It's not what Anthony is saying. It's not what Odelia or Maria is saying. It's what Jesus said. And there are those who oppose the word. There are, there, are, there are people out there in the body of Christ. When we give them this message, they oppose it. But they're not opposing us. They're opposing Jesus. And if you're opposing Jesus, you are opposing the Father. Can you, are, you, are you hearing me out there? When you oppose those of us who are bringing this message, that's what Jesus told his disciples. If they are persecuting you, they are persecuting me. If they persecute me, they are persecuting the one who sent me. If they don't believe your words, they're not believing my words. And the words that I bring are not mine, but the Father who sent me. The, the words I'm reading to you now are the words of Jesus. Jesus, why is Jesus, does Jesus keep saying, and the kingdom is as, and the kingdom is like. <coughs> What about it? What is it? And it's simply, really, the kingdom is the reign and the rule of God. If you belong to God, if you say you belong to him, if you say you are a follower of Christ, then what's the problem with that term? What's the problem with saying kingdom? What is the problem with us understanding or not understanding that this are the words of Jesus, that this was Jesus' mandate to preach the kingdom. Jesus didn't come preaching about himself. What's the problem? What's wrong? 
Jesus didn't come preaching about himself. He came preaching the kingdom. He came talking about the reign and the rule of God operating in the hearts of men. That's all it's about. But see, it's just like these people who Jesus was talking to. What's up, prophet? It was just like these people that Jesus was talking to. Jesus came revealing to them the heart of the Father. <coughs> Jesus came revealing to them the truth of the Father. But just like today, just like back then, so it is today, they heard it, knew it was the truth, but because they didn't want to change and come up off their traditions. And they wanted to stay in their traditional settings. They wanted to keep on with their liturgical type of worship. They didn't want to <clears throat> they didn't want to kill that cash cow. Uh-oh. -uh. They didn't want to, they didn't want to, they didn't want to go from them. See, in order to take this on, see, you got to change. Really, when you came into this, the kingdom, when you repent of your sins and begin the renewing of your mind, you're supposed to start the renewing of your mind, but you just didn't know what you were supposed to renew your mind to. You thought that just memorizing scripture was going to renew your mind. Uh, no, come on now. I did. Am I, am I alone in this? We thought that scripture memorization and being able to quote scripture was going to bring transformation, that it was going to bring change. Did it? No, it's the obeying of it. Transformation takes place when the scripture read becomes the scripture lived. That's a good note right there. <coughs> That's a good note to write right there. Transformation takes place when the scripture memorized becomes the scripture lived. Jesus is coming, teaching us the life of God. He's revealing to us the spirit of God. He's revealing to us the culture of the kingdom. He's revealing to us the spirit of the law going beyond the letter of the law because all the letter of the law did was produce death. The, the, the written letters all got you as a stoning. It got you separated. But God, God sent Jesus said, I don't want to kill you. I don't want to take you out like this. I don't want to have to judge you. I want you to understand that this is a matter of the heart. I want you to understand my word is not, see, I, what, what the Lord wants you to do, he wants to, to, to get you and train your thinking and have you train your mind and, get, and, and change your thoughts before the thoughts turn in to the action of sin. Sin starts in the heart. It don't start with the action. The action was a byproduct of how you think. It was a byproduct of of your mindset. You is a byproduct of living life, experiencing life and living life from your soulish man, from your mind, your will, and your emotions. Whatever your eyes see, you want it. Whatever your your mind told you what to do, you did it. And you came into agreement with it, no matter what the thought was, but you thought that was your mind. <coughs> you thought that was your thought. But if your thoughts don't line up with the word of God, <coughs> pardon me. If your mind does not line up with the word of God, if your thinking doesn't line up with God's word, then transformation can take place. You can learn all the scriptures you want to learn. You can quote the Bible from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation 21. You can, you can know from Genesis to Revelation because there's many that do. There's many. There are those who teach Bible college and are deans of universities that are atheists. <laughs> that don't even believe the full counsel of God. They got cherry-picked scriptures that they live by and they go by and they really, oh my God. Don't even believe in the spirit of God. But they're teaching major universities. They're releasing leaders. They're releasing people. to. to they don't believe in apostles, but they're releasing 
people to preach the gospel. Saying the, the apostolic ministry no longer exists, but they're releasing leaders. That don't even make sense. But because they live in life by their soul and have no clue about the spirit, they're separated, even with their degree. They're separated, even with having Bible knowledge. But Paul said like that, knowledge puffs up. Mere Bible knowledge, just knowing some scriptures by heart, will puff you up if it's not backed up by the Spirit, if it's not backed up by obedience to the scripture. It's obedience that produces the life of God. It's doing what he said. That's what, what the, the key about the, the, the blessing of Abraham that everybody, they want the blessing of Abraham, but they don't understand that the blessing of Abraham was based upon Abraham's obedience. Abraham could have heard what God said and sat right where he was. But the Bible says that after God had instructed Abraham to leave his family and friendly, <coughs> pardon me, With his stripes. <laughs> I know some of you have heard me use that example before. But what I'm trying to get over to us is, and the, <clears throat> the main thing I'm trying to get over is the seeking that Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We have to seek, seek ye first the reign and the rule of God and his way of doing and being right. <coughs> Pardon me. And everything that you need for your life will be added unto you. But you got to seek. Proverbs 25 2. <coughs> Once again, Proverbs 25 2 says, It is the Glory of God to conceal a matter. But the honor of kings is to search a matter out. You created in the likeness and image of God. Peter said that you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Revelation 1 verses 5 and 6 tell us that through the blood of Jesus, we have made, been made kings and priests unto God. So is the honor of kings to search a matter out. It's the glory, it's the honor of kings to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All throughout. <coughs> and right now we're in Matthew chapter 13 for those of you who just turned in, tuned in. Thank you for coming on. We're in Matthew 13. <laughs> And I started out at verse, I just read verses 44 through 46. That's why I'm still caught up here because it, where it says, I'm going to read it again for those who just tuned in. Matthew 13, 44 says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he have, oh God, and buyeth that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. God wants to know will you sell all that you have to make his kingdom and righteousness your number one priority? Will he become first? God wants to know, will, he be, will you make him first in your life? Will you seek his rule and his reign first place in your life? <laughs> That's what he wants to know. See, so when we we think about the drudgery. See, he wants to know. I, I'm thinking about it now. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he said, "Not my will, but your will be done." See, the crucifixion happened before he got on the cross. When he said, not my will, but your will be done. He at first said, if there be some other way, let this cup pass. But if not, let your will be done. 
And then God said, all right, there it is. And so God is waiting for that same thing. He wants, he is waiting for every single believer to have that Garden of Gethsemane experience. That he's waiting for you to come to a place where he say, not my will, but your will be done. We talk about the, the parable of, the, of the, the weeds of the field. The tears of the field. We just talked about that parable. We talked about how that, in comparison, when a when the wheat comes to full maturity, it bends over, it bows itself, it bows itself over. But the darnell, the tears, stand straight up, and that's why he said, "I'm waiting for you to come to full maturity. I'm waiting to the end of this thing." And then I'll separate the wheat from the tear. And you got to go back. You gotta, if you just tune in this, you got to go back to the beginning to hear what we talked about concerning the tears of the field. For many years, many of us thought that when we read that verse, that that was talking about in the church. But when Jesus came back and talked to his disciples and revealed to them <coughs> the mystery of the parable, we found out that it wasn't the church that Jesus was talking about, but he was talking about the entire world. Uh, I'm not going to go back there. Y'all trying to make me go back there. But I'm not going to go back. Re get, get the video. Watch the replay of the video. But what Jesus is looking at, he said, will you sell all? Will you sell your, your favorite TV program? Will you sell game seven of the NBA Finals? <laughs> Will you sell the Super Bowl? Talk, talking to my brothers out there. Will you sell your favorite program? Will you sell the time that you spend on the internet? Will you sell the time that you spend on the phone? Will you sell the time that you spend on Facebook? Will you sell all? Will you sell the time that you spend on the phone with her? Spend on the phone with him? <coughs> Will you sell all to seek his rule and his reign governing in your, our lives moment to moment, day by day? That's what he's looking for. That's his desire. <coughs> and even in this study that we're doing, this systematic study, Going through these kingdom verses as we study. As you can see, this is this systematic, and this is not some subject that you master like you use in school or even in a religious system. We get some things, okay, I master this subject and then I put it on the shelf with the other subjects that I call myself mastering. But the thing is about this kingdom. <coughs> And about this kingdom message and this kingdom revelation, is it's there's it's lifetime learning because there's no end to the revelation. It always changes. He always has something fresh. He always gives you something new. You can take one scripture and he can take you on, and you can study it, or even begin to share it with people, and it'll take you into places and dimensions that you never went before. But we have to put ourselves to it. Not just to get the understand, not just to get the knowledge. What's up, my brother, brother Ant? I see you, man. It's, we had to do more than just. I can remember, and I see my bro in the line here from Jayville. Well, he's from Pittsburgh, but we met in Jayville. Or being wanting so much to know the scriptures, we we were enamored. We were. Uh, Impressed by those who had this knowledge of the scripture, and we wanted that same knowledge. Amen. Nothing wrong with that. But it has to go from knowledge to be producing life. After we get the knowledge of it in our head, it has to bypass our heads and get in our hearts and produce the life that we took. And it's a seed. We read a couple of weeks ago the parable of the sower. And in Luke's account of the parable of the sower he says that the word of God is the seed and so that word has to take shape in our lives as it come from and that's even in myself and in my own life I know he has me on a journey right now he's dealing with me in the areas of 
character and integrity because in order to deliver this message, it, it just can't be something that you we preach and teach, but it has to be something that we have to live, there, this anointing. See, the anointing, the gift that you have is not gonna, does not make you, uh-oh, does not make you righteous in the sight of God, but it's the life. It's that anointing that you have to preach, that anointing that you have to teach, that anointing that you have to lay hands on the sick, that anointing that you have to raise the dead. It's wonderful. Those gifts come from God. He's the one that's giving it to you. But <coughs> we've already read this too. Back in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to me is the most scary, the scariest, the most frightening verses of scripture in the Bible where Jesus said, many will come to me in that day. And they say, did we not cast out devils? Did we not heal the sick? And in thy name do many wonderful works. And I will profess unto them, I know you not. Depart from me, ye who work iniquity. And the word iniquity there means, the definition is to be lawless. You were doing all the things of God. You were doing all the stuff. But because you didn't produce the life, because the life wasn't being produced, Jesus said that you were full of iniquity. He said, I don't know you. Yeah, you was doing a miracle in my name. You were prophesying in my name. But I don't know you. I empowered you to do those things because, see, that's the thing is, that anointing is not for you. It's for somebody else. <coughs> so God not really impressed with that because he gave it to you for that person. But what he wants to know is the life, the, the, the word that I'm putting into you, is it producing the life? He's looking for the life. When you are a parent, you know, those of y'all out there are parents, you have children. I, I can talk to my dads in particular. But when that baby was born, you were trying to see if that baby looked like you. You were trying to see if there was any resemblance to you. So when we are born again, Jesus is looking for the likeness. Jesus is looking for those trying to see if that person out there that say they my child resemble me. Do they walk like me? Do they have my nose? You, you know how you did. Do they have my eyebrows, <laughs> my ears? Looking for something that resembles them. And Jesus is doing the same thing. You can do all the stuff. You can do all the stuff. But Jesus is still looking like, is that mine? Well, that belong, uh, uh, that's somebody else's baby. Come on now. Jesus wants to know, do you belong to me? How will he know that you belong to him? When you begin to seek him with all your heart. When you begin to seek first. See, that's what these verses for, are for. Verses 44 through 46. Let me read them again. I, I just love, listen to it again. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field, the which when a man hath found this hidden treasure, for joy, he hide, he hide it, he found it, he, he was joyful about happy, and he hid it. Then he went back and sold everything to buy that field. <clears throat> again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. And when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Amen. <coughs> Jesus wants you to sell out. Now he, he, and he may say it, but I'm not saying he's saying, telling you, sell everything that you bless and go hide somewhere in a cave. No. That, that wouldn't do him any good. Wouldn't do you any good. And it wouldn't do him any good. But he wants to know if you're ready to, how, how they say it, break yourself. In other words, oh God, are you ready to get off the throne of your life? Are you ready to stop trying to control everything and control everybody? 
You grown. You make your own decisions. I'll do what I want to do. How's that working for you? How has that worked for you? Because right now, to where we are right now, we are all the example. We are all become that. Whatever decision we made, made, we are now the sum total of that decision. But the decision that Jesus is asking you, he wants to know, do you love me? Do you, do you want to seek me? And he said, if you seek, the Lord said it like this, they that seek me will find me when they have sought for me with all their heart. All their heart. So God is looking for someone that's seeking him with all their heart. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put a pen in it for today. Amen. We went over time a little bit, but that's okay. And we're going to continue and hopefully we'll be finishing up chapter 13. Ha <laughs> ha. By tomorrow, get over to some other kingdom chapters. Amen. <coughs> But that's it. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Sell all. Jesus said it like this. They that love mother and father more than me is not worthy of me. They that love their husband or wife more than me is not worthy of me. Children. And he's not saying that they don't have importance in your life. He's not saying for you to get a divorce. Stop it. <laughs> but what he is saying is. Do you put life, do you put your family, do you put your wife, your, your husband, your children, <clears throat> even your parents before me? Because guess what? You're not going to be able to even deal in those situations unless God is first. Unless you make God's kingdom, Jesus' kingdom, and righteousness First place in your life, you're going to live a torp life. I think we've already read it already. About the person that built their hands, house on the sand. How when the rains came and the wind blew upon it, and great was the fall of that house because it was built on sand. But they that built their house on a rock. <laughs> When the winds came, when the floods came, when the winds blew, the house stood because it was founded upon a rock. And that rock is Jesus. Unless you make him your number one priority. Even though you might be religious, yes, you may even be born again, but unless you make him number one, unless you are renewing your mind the way he wants, unless you seek him on his terms, not your own, but on his terms, then you'll not live the life, amen, that Jesus is calling for you and saved you and requiring for you to live. I'm not saying that you won't experience things in life, but the fact of the matter, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So no matter what you're doing, as long as you submit yourself to the will of the Father, you're seeing life and viewing life from righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we thank you <coughs> for everyone under the sound of my voice who heard this word today, who will hear it on the recording. I thank you, Father, for what you know. I thank you for this revelation. Lord. I thank you, Lord God, that we are now seeking your kingdom <coughs> and your righteousness like right? love before. We understand now, Lord God, that this was your mandate. From the time the world began, we understand from the Genesis chapter 1 that you created us to have dominion and to rule the earth and to subdue it <coughs> and to have dominion over it in righteousness. That we were to rule the world in righteousness, Lord God. As you rule from heaven with righteousness, you place your man servant on the earth to rule in righteousness. <coughs> So thank you for restoring to us the power. Thank you for restoring to us your spirit. <clears throat> that we might live and be the expression of your power. We bless you again, Lord God. We thank you. 
And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. God bless you for tuning in. And we're going to be back tomorrow. <coughs> Pardon me. Time to be announced for the continuation of this systematic study of the kingdom of God and the gospels. And we're still in the book of Matthew. We've been in the book of Matthew amen, for a minute here. I believe since January, maybe longer. <coughs> but amen. It's going to take as long as it's going to take. It's going to take as long as the spirit wants to reveal and how he wants to reveal it. Because he wants you to get this in your spirit. Not only that, he doesn't want this study to stop with me, with you here on this broadcast no he wants you to go back and he wants you to go over he wants you to go into the scriptures and and, and into the gospels and start reading and everywhere you see the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of god mentioned he wants you to highlight it study it get it in your spirit so you understand and start coming to the knowledge and understanding of god's kingdom mandate for man and for the earth so god bless you we'll tune you in See you again tomorrow and when you tune in for another episode of the Transforming Live broadcast, Transforming Lives broadcast, excuse me. Amen. God bless you and we'll talk to you again.